around uh of daniel's mabingo mabingo are you online mabingo can you hear me Mabingo, you in? Mabingo, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Great. Wonderful. Good, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, conversation series. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Quiz Tabaro. I'm so yeah. honored to be here. Thank you for hosting me. You're welcome. And I, I hope you listened to the drums that were playing before this uh, conversation started. I did, I did. Um, I did listen to the drums. I think I created that with my friends in, uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, about sometime last year. Please tell and us more about the, the beats. Are these Ugandan beats? <laughs> They're a mixture of... Uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. They are not Ugandan, and I don't think they can be. Uh, probably the only Ugandan about um, about them is just me. Um, I have uh, I had friends in New Zealand. I had one from Ghana. I had one from Kentucky. I had from one from Nigeria, mm. and then I had one from Botswana. Mm. I had one from uh, the UK, mm. and then I had one from Zimbabwe, mm. and then I had another friend from uh, the Congo. And so we just, you know, came together and created that. And so when you have that diversity, mm. nationalities definitely have to take back seat and just let creativity take its course. Oh, so the, the, in short, this is an Afrofusion of sort. It's more, yeah, you can call it Afrofusion or some kind of Pan-Africanism being expressed in music Interesting. and drums for this matter. <laughs> Interesting. Good to have you, uh, Mabingo. And you know, uh, while I was preparing for this conversation, I landed on notes I had written the very first time I interviewed you on 21st June 2014. I don't know if you remember our conversation. I do. I do remember all our conversations. Mm, and, and the uh, topic of the conversation, I've, I've, I've just seen the notes here, then was... Uh, uh, the substance of 21st century Pan-Africanism, intellectualism, art and expression, which is not so far off uh, what we're going to discuss uh, in, the, you know, in our chat later today. Yes, please. Mm. Now, uh, briefly, tell me about um, this dream um, to be a dance scholar uh, that started with you trying out uh, um, at being a, a Catholic priest and then much later a lawyer before you eventually landed on uh, dance in 2002? I think I can say that I'm just uh, a child of faith. Mm. Um, so original as you have briefly outlined, my intention wasn't to end up where I am now. Mm. Uh, it was completely another universe that I was, you know, um, <clears throat> imagining and envisaging to be mm. and that didn't happen so i want to go back into that history i'll just just take you to 2002 mm. uh, when i was admitted for a degree in, um, in dance at um, the university and how did this come mm. how did this come about so that year mm. we had the traditional <coughs> the ugandans will tell you uh the traditional application um the job forms for a level or a level mm. high school mm. so i applied and still i applied for law mass form and all that and then we had courses that were introduced mm. towards um i think it was around i think it was around uh either February or march of that year mm. oh, 2002. <clears throat> i think around that time yeah mm. and um and they had all these new courses. Mm. Uh, uh, human, resource was, human resource was one of them. Mm. International business was one of them. Mm. Um, entrepreneurship was one of them. Mm. Bachelor of Arts degree in dance was one of them. So I said, on, I'll, no, I'll give it a shot as well. Mm. And so 
I applied and put that uh, course, the Bachelor of Dance course, the last one, because I just wanted to fill the positions and there were six. Mm -hmm. So it was number six, and that is the course that I was given on government sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So that's how I start uh, crawling back into this world of dance and music, and it wasn't easy to transit mm -hmm. and orient, reorient my thinking to just accept that I was going to be a performing artist. Mm -hmm. But I had systems to, as an individual, to manage that, and I think I made the right decision, and here I am. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, uh, you credit a lot of your uh, uh, interest and, and skills in dance to what you call the village life and the experience um, that has always been the sole genesis of your artistic creativity and vision. Did your yes. upbringings uh, in PG, in, uh, in uh, rural Uganda, shape in any way your interest in dance? Uh, I wouldn't say it shaped my interest in dance then because I didn't even know that someone would um, uh, um, pursue or even, you know, develop a career in dance, you know. Mm. So it was something that we did as children, you know, you make music, mm. you make instruments, you play instruments, you play music, you, you dance, you do games. It's part of life. It's life. You know, it is it's so, so transient. Mm. It exists and then it goes. Mm. And then you go on with your dreams. So it is that kind of experience that I had and that environment mm. um, that I was invested in then. Mm. And so it disappeared mm. when I went to a boarding school, middle school, but it was lying deep, deep somewhere. Mm. And then I rediscovered that when I started you know, studying uh, music, dance and drama at Makere University. Mm. And then everything now started making sense. So it was more, you can say, re retrospective in that sense. Mm. And so I started making that journey to my past and trying to make sense out of um, that kind of childhood upbringing, childhood environment, the creativity. And so I started rationalizing that experience eh, mm. in the retrospect. Mm. And I discovered that it was rich, it was authentic, it was meaningful, mm. and above all, it was meant to, to shape humanity mm. and shape someone to be a better citizen of this world. So that is what I've always tapped into, mm. much as it's really many years later. Mm. But I still go back to that and I consider it as my uh, foundation and launch pad mm. for whether my writings, or whether the models that I've developed to create and teach, you know, music and dance, mm. or whether it's the theories that I'm trying to, to develop mm. and, um, and write about in this field of uh, music and dance. Interesting. And, you know, it's been um, an 18-year journey um, try, uh, trying to study and understand music, and uh, the culmination of which is an upcoming book, um, Ubuntu as Dance Pedagogy in Uganda. Now, I know the title is coming out much later this year, but I wanted to take you back to something you wrote in 2012 in an opinion uh, with the Daily Monitor. Yes. You, say, uh, you said, and I quote, uh, people have always enjoyed the freedom that arts provide for expression. Originally, communities in Africa used to create, recreate, perform, share and appreciate the arts as a community. It is this unifying communal philosophy that gave birth to the current ethnic music and traditional dances that we enjoy today. Now, the question from that is, uh, is this where you derive this concept of Ubuntu, which is... Uh, I believe a central idea in your in your teaching of dance, both in Uganda and uh, all over the world, where you've had the opportunity to teach uh, uh, pedagogy of dance. But also, is is this uh, is this the reason why it's uh, it's uh, such an underlying theme in your book? I don't know if I was clear. Uh, the question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the question is very clear, and thank you for it, for that uh, question. I think it's more of an expression that tries to touch on that theme of Ubuntu. But by the time I wrote that um, article, I've written many for the Daily Monitor mm -hmm. in that respect, uh, uh, the arts, I hadn't yet investigated more 
this idea of um, Ubuntu as um, um, a central theme yeah. and as um, under, um, an underlying uh, philosophy or worldview mm. that informs the way we think, the way we know, the way we become, mm. and also the way we identify. Mm. So, but I think my thinking along those lines started forming around that time when I started to investigate more the thinking behind how we create, how we perform, and how we share art. Mm. And so it's something that has been developing for quite some time, and it has taken quite a great deal of investigation for me mm. to get to a point where I was really confident and comfortable to expand that and construct it into this wonderful, wonderful uh, book mm. that I've written will be coming out uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the second half of this year. Maybe for, for our audience, you could expound on this concept of uh, Ubuntu and how it relates to the teaching of dancers. Um, well, basically, um, the concept of Ubuntu, you can, uh, I think the person that really, 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 really uh, compressed it and simplified it best was um, the late African philosopher called John Mbiti. Mm. He wrote um, a book on African religion and philosophy. Mm. And Mbiti um, summarized the Ubuntu as, uh, as uh, something, an experience, uh, uh, it's an experience, it's a feeling, it's a practice, mm. it's a way of thinking mm. that is represented by this kind of expression. I am because we are, mm. and because we are, therefore I am. Mm. And so, uh, within our tradition and within our practice and our thinking, and by we I mean generally communities across Africa, mm. there is that idea of caring for one another. Mm. So our form of individualism is a, it's a kind of individualism mm. that recognizes uh, the mm. presence uh, and the importance and relevance of other individuals. Mm. within a community mm. and also within ourselves mm. as human beings. Mm. And so that is what connects us. That is what makes someone be like, okay, I'll contribute to someone's introduction, mm. even when they don't know them. Mm. Okay? Mm. Yeah. So we still have that um, going, um, our, uh, that kind of spirit, mm. which if you travel to the Western world, you realize that they have quite a huge deficit when it comes to that mindset of caring for the yeah. other person. Mm. And so I see that in um, uh, the way uh, knowledge of dance is, is shared. Mm. Um, I see it in performances of dances, especially mm. in communities that haven't been touched eh, mm. by the liberal, neoliberal economic mindset and so my book centers on those communities that mm. are really a bit they're standing a bit outside that paradigm of neoliberalism and that's where i derive mm. my thinking mm. and the configuration and construction mm. that i make around how that philosophy of ubuntu intercedes mm. with how those communities mm. teach and learn in the Ignatz dances. In, interesting. And I remember one of our conversations, uh, I don't know, it's been maybe two, three years, uh, about traditional dances in Uganda. I'm, I'm only familiar with Uganda, so maybe you can enlighten me if the case is the same elsewhere in Africa. That our traditional dances in Uganda tend to involve more than one individual, at least four or five individuals. So it's an ensemble of dancers. There's a drama is a dancer and dancing itself is storytelling and in a way it's a medium through which um, traditional values and information is shared. Is this yes, uh, with commu uh, communalism and Ubuntu? Yes, um, that's exact, uh, that's what I hint on. Mm. So there is that kind of plurality mm. uh, which derives from individuality. Mm. 
So um, if you really analyze it uh, well and, uh, 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 and take time mm. to try and track mm. how that system is organized and exercised and celebrated, mm. you realize that there is a strong focus on individual innovation. Mm. But then that individu individual innovation exists mm. within that space of other individuals. Mm. And so it's those di different uh, um, individualities mm. that congregate mm. and then they create something mm. that is taken as a communal good, mm. if you understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. And that it also extends into a kind of a communal experience. Mm. So I think um, our traditional uh, indigenous dances are unique in that sense, but my kind of travel mm. has really uh, 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 um, taught me mm. that it actually cuts across quite a number of native communities. I work a lot in, in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, mm. in Barbados, in, um, in the Bahamas, mm. and you find the same kind of spirit and the same kind of practice. Mm. I work um, a, a lot with communities from the Pacific, Tonga, Samoa, New Way, Cook Island, mm. and you know, a number of other nations in the Pacific. Mm. And you really find that kind of spirit mm. and that kind of thinking is still central mm. to how the approach processes of creating. And so I think there is, it is something that is unique to mm. communities that are not considered Western industrialized Mm. and capitalistic societies. Mm. And I'm still investigating to further find out mm. why that, that pattern is mm. still existing. Interesting. And I know your, uh, your teaching of uh, dance has uh, taken you to countries like Jamaica. Was this uh, because there we, we see a mixture of both native uh, populations, but also uh, recent immigrants. and. Uh, the mix, uh, one would assume, would uh, produce something that uh, would be a bit different from uh, uh, what you'd find in, in, in Africa or somewhere in, um, uh, also in the Caribbean, where you have smaller, yes. more native societies. Yeah, uh, yes um, and no. Mm. Yes, in the sense that if you look at just the art form as art, you realize that, yes, there is a lot that has been created, um, and I'm speaking about Jamaica specifically. Yes. Uh, where I have been uh, doing uh, some extensive work in the education and also research. Mm. Uh, so you find that, for example, you look at dance hall, you know, dance hall, just, you know, mm. the form, you know, that emerged in the 70s, mm. um, but it's really unique from hip hop, which mm. also emerged almost around the same period of time. And it's just next door in the United States of America. Uh, 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 but so you realize that dance, dance hall is just different from hip hop. And so in that sense, they create something that is really unique to Jamaica. Yeah. But they also, the spirit, yeah. what I discovered is that the spirit yeah. and their desire is purely African. Yeah. Now we can go into defining what African, African. means. Yeah. But I think for, by and large, my experience in Jamaica, I discovered that it's a country that is really, really proud to be African. Mm. They, are re they really celebrate it. So the spirit in that sense, all you can call it the software, mm. is still tilting, leaning more towards that thing mm. called African. They look back, Sankofa. Mm. You know, that uh, Ghanaian philosophy, they always look back. Mm. But when they create, they look at the environment and where they are, mm. and their history mm. um, being, you know, a country that was created out of uh, the Middle Passage, then they create something that really responds mm. to that kind of um, heritage. Right. So I found that kind of blend mm. uh, to be rich, but also interesting. In quite uh, so many ways. 
Hold on to that thought. Um, I, I want you to, you know, uh, step back a bit and uh, answer a question from uh, one of the participants, Lisa Wilson, um, who's asking, how does one manifest Ubuntu meaningfully in, the, in a dance class with students from diverse cultures and uh, dance training that can often carry hierarchical notions of each other? No, I think for me, and I'll just straight away uh, 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 um, jump to how I try to cultivate that. I think for me, having taught in Europe, I've taught in North America, I've taught in, the, in Australia, uh, and that is what guides my uh, pedagogic philosophy. Mm -hmm. I think what I try to tell my students and my collaborators and participants is that one, let's first create an experience for everybody. Mm. And so when you approach it from an experiential kind of perspective, mm. then you bring in the idea of inclusion because mm. any person can contribute to an experience even if they are not, they don't consider to be the best dancers or dramas or musicians. So I try to make um, the experience to be the overarching central theme. And that brings everybody together because everybody has an experience to share. Mm -hmm. I also try to discourage as much as possible this kind of uh, Western objectifying notion that a dancer must have this body, a dancer must be this perfect, mm -hmm. and try to create a space, and I call it a safe space, mm. for different individuals to come and be. Mm. So I, I emphasize that. And once you open the space for different individuals to come in and be, mm. and you also remind them that it's non-judgmental, so bodies are really not being judged, whether this one is the perfect kind of slim body, and that is good for dance, and this one is not then you realize that people express that freedom and then they come out, innovate more, create more, collaborate more, share more, and they keep on um, adding on those layers that form the experience within that space. And I think and believe mm. that our advances come from that perspective and that kind of thinking. Mm. And if they are to be shared, I think that thinking should be maintained regardless of where that kind of activity is being convened. And so that is how I try to approach it. But of course, I also recognize that communities have their unique circumstances mm. and they have their unique needs. Mm. And so I try as much as possible to also understand what are the needs, what are the circumstances of this particular community, this particular class, or even to a very large extent, particular individuals that come and partake in the dance activities. So those are some of the things that I try to, 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 to introduce so that people get into the Ubuntu. I also emphasize this, and I think the world needs to know that Ubuntu is learned, but it's not taught. What's it is difference? lived. It is lived. You, you're born into it. Mm. If you are in a society that doesn't celebrate it in all facets of life, mm. you can't teach it. At school, mm. you teach it, and then at home, mm. the children are being told you are an individual, you have to do better than Jane, your sister, you have to do better than Peter, whoever, you know, that kind of competitive environment at home, if you teach it at school, but it doesn't exist at home. <laughs> You're wasting your time. So I tell people that back home in Africa, we are born into it, we live it, mm. okay? Mm. So, and then we learn it. But you cannot design a course outline like they asked me one day in the US to go and teach Ubuntu. I turned down the invitation. I told them I can't waste my time mm. to teach Ubuntu in New York City, mm. where students just go and everybody is on their iPad or their iPhone almost 10 hours a day. They don't want to relate to someone who's next to them, mm. you know? Yeah, so it's something that is celebrated within community, 
mm. and it's something that you're born into and you learn it and live it. Mm. So I recognize those kind of strictures and those constraints mm. when I try to pursue the idea that this can be expanded or disseminated yeah, mm. across different global demographics. Thank you. And thank you, Lisa, for the question. For our participants, I think you can send in your questions throughout the conversation, and I'll have Mabingo answer, answer them as we go, so that we can keep this as uh, engaging as possible. Now, Mabingo, I would like to uh, take you back to the Sankofa philosophy that uh, you had talked about from Ghana, looking back. And uh, in one of your papers, you talk about two prominent um, African uh, thought leaders who have articulated two com complementary visions for the empowerment of black people. On one hand, you have uh, people like uh, Molefi Asante, who has advocated for what he's called Afrocentricity, which is a system of thought that considers the African worldview as a key driver of human progress. And on the other hand, you have uh, people like the late Professor Ali Mazrui, who has suggested that through something he calls horizontal inter interpenetration, Black people across geographical locations can exchange ideas and experiences as a way of advancing, um, you know, self empowerment and actualization in this era of uh, Western hegemonic uh, trends like uh, neoliberalism. How are you, as a Black scholar uh, of dance, using uh, the pedagogies of African dancers to advance such visions? Do you subscribe to any at all? Uh, yeah, I do, and I think I do, and I strongly subscribe to yeah, um, quite a number of um, um, those theories and uh, the thinkers. Um, and that's why I really, really draw on a number of um, resources that these thinkers have uh, generously shared with us uh, to try and um, uh, advance the case for, for dance education. Um, um, I, and I, I think you, uh, uh, that quote came from a, an article that I wrote about my work in Chepaika. Yes. But to just expand further, I think for me mm. as a scholar, uh, there is a statement that uh, the late Ali Emma's really made that to be a giant, you need to stand on shoulders of other giant. giants. Mm. <laughs> mm. So I think if we are to position mm. um, um, our dances and our dance epistemology knowledge mm. um, uh, 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 competitively and claim space mm. uh, in global scholarship and research, I think we need to figure out how we can engage mm. our own thinkers mm. to make a case mm. for our knowledge, you know, um, to add more value mm. and more validity to the knowledge that we um, uh, um, generate through research, or even the kind of teaching and learning methods that we develop as teachers. Mm. Uh, so my work uh, draws on a number of scholars, uh, Asante, uh, okay, mm. um, Ali Mazilu is big, Ngugi Wathiong is big, mm. um, Valentino Wai Modimbe, that Afri wonderful African philosopher. Mm. And then I also extend it to people like Franz Fanon. Mm. And um, I also move outside the continent, you know, and look at people like uh, the late Edward Said, mm. who wrote a wonderful book called Orientalism. Mm. So I think we need to engage all these different voices mm. to try and locate mm. our own voice and mm. try and develop uh, Mm. models eh, mm. that draw on those different uh, intellectual heritages eh, mm. to just create something new, something that is really suitable and something that is relevant to dance studies mm. in Africa. Mm. Interesting. Now, you know, in, uh, in uh, Uganda or for that matter in uh, many parts of Africa, if someone says that they are a dancer or a dance instructor, the idea is that uh, that's their trade, the way someone is, uh, is a teacher, a lawyer, and uh, that all they do is perform for pay. 
especially uh, abroad outside our communities. And uh, as a result of that, you've had a number of cultural, uh, quote unquote, dance troops. Um, some of them uh, include orphanages that have become popular for you know, going out there, performing, and uh, earning a living out of that. But the way you approach dance is a little bit different. Yours is music, dance, and drama as a tool in the classroom for teaching. Where do you draw the distinction, or is there a distinction? I don't think uh, there is any distinction, to be very honest with you. I don't think uh, um, there is any distinction. And why am I saying this? Um, our art stands eh, mm. on, uh, if it was like the traditional fireplace, mm. a choto, mm. uh, mm. in my mpiji wa mama okota kind of thinking, mm. you know, you have so many uh, stones, mm. amasiga, okay? So our art really stands on quite a number of stones. You can call them strands okay. in our language. Mm. All pillars. So you have performance, you have choreography that can can have technique. You have functionality, the cultural function, and so all these. And then you have uh, pedagogy. Mm. So all these different pillars eh, they work in concert. It's a concert. Mm. It's a concert. So I cannot really really go and find out knowledge about <laughs> how people learn and teach if they don't do it. Mm. And when they do it, sometimes that is performance. Mm. And I can't find knowledge about what they do if they don't create it or recreate it, mm. you see. Mm. And then I can't still find this relevance of pedagogy if I don't find out the functionality. The, why are they doing it? Mm. Okay. So I think uh, to just bring back uh, the conversation to your question, uh, I think performance, pedagogy, choreography, the cultural issues, interpretation of the dances, they all work hand in hand. What I try to do in my research and my scholarship is to introduce pedagogy as a domain of knowledge mm. that is not distinct, but a domain of knowledge that works in concert with other domains of knowledge, mm. but at the same time, it has its own unique characteristics. So I'm trying to look, people have looked at dance from a performance perspective, from a choreographic perspective. You have so many people have talked about the functional aspects of dance, etc. I come in to look at the pedagogic aspect. Mm. And I think this pedagogic aspect is so central because it speaks to how this knowledge is transmitted mm. from either person to another person, from one context mm. to another context. Mm. So I think it is something that really um, deserves uh, um, extra investigation and so that's what informs the kind of focus that I have when it comes to dance studies which is pedagogy. But I recognize the importance of other aspects and other facets of dance performance because without them I cannot, I cannot uh, 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 qualify pedagogy as uh, an underpinning domain of dance practice. And you're going to say that uh, total education of a learner needs to stimulate um, what you define as multiple intelligences. Maybe you could expound on that. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So and I'll take you back um, that the challenge we've had with our dances, you hinted on it, and I thought you were going to go towards that direction, but finally you have, mm. is that uh, if you read the books of history, or even if you interviewed the people on the streets of Kampala, mm. and or even Makerere University, mm. if you entered the offices of professors mm. and you asked them about dance, they'll tell you, no, it is something that people just do, 
to feel happy and feel good. It's about merry making. And you go to the, uh, 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 for, for me as a researcher, when I did my research for my PhD, I went to the university library at Makere University. That library, special Africana section, has a lot. I'm not doing an advert for, for Makere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but to let people know. Mm. But what you find there are those kind of uh, colonial, post colonial, those early years recordings, and they look at dancers eh? mm. in a way that if they said the words that they said then, eh? mm. the world would be like, what? Mm. Petitions would be really flying all over the world uh. to just call them to order. You see, is uh, 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 dancers in an African village, they dance and they don't get tired. The men dance around the women as if they want to have sex. The women will go their waist and they look at dance, male dancers in a suggestive way. This means these people only dance for sex. Mm. You know, they did a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds in like a, a National Geographic narration. Uh, of 1930s and 20s. Yes. Eh? Mm. Eh, and some 1940s and 50s. Mm. So, uh, but you realize that in all that there's objectification of one African body. Mm. They look at it as an object. Mm. They look at it as a, something that a fetish mm. that can be fetishized. Something that is exotic. Exotic the just, mm. Yeah, it's just, so we call that object, objectification. Mm. And so, so the kind of scholarship that we are trying to introduce about our dances that no, mm. our dances are not about that body. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, um, um, uh, 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 um, scholar um, uh, um, in the US mm. who wrote a book and then uh, had the three Bs, boobs, belly, mm. and, and mm. bum, mm. and bum, the three Bs, boobs, mm. belly, and bum. Mm. And um, she's called God, God's Child, mm. God's Child, wonderful. Mm. Um, and so she talks about how even in the US in the 60s, they were looking at a black dancer, female dancer, someone who was just expressing the boobs, the belly, and the bums. Mm. And so there's a lot of objectification going on. And what we are trying to say mm. is that our knowledge in our dances and music goes beyond the body that you want to objectify. So mm. that's where I introduced this idea of multiple intelligences, mm. that when we do what we do. Mm. There are so many intelligences that we apply mm. to the kind of work, the kind of activities that we do. It's a science. Mm. There is kinesthetic intelligence. Mm. There is a musical intelligence. Mm. There is emotional intelligence. Mm. There is even mathematical intelligence. If we have to go into analysis of dance forms, <laughs> you'll be so surprised that in some cases, dance has been used mm. to teach children how mm. to improve their mathematics. Mm. So, so we, we are trying to expand the thinking. Mm. We are trying to de-objectify the histories mm. and de-objectify people's thinkings about dance. And so that's where I, I derive as an educator, mm. that's where I derive the mm. idea that uh, and that is actually um, um, uh, 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 Howard Gardner. Mm. Howard Gardner is an American theorist. He mm. developed the idea of multiple intelligence. Mm. So I, I bring Howard Gardner, the theorist, into this conversation as well. So that's what my mission is, to try and show that our knowledge is valid and valuable knowledge mm. that has the mind, Mm. but also the body. Mm. And now, I don't know if, if on your end you can see the questions that are coming through the chat group. You will uh, respond to them uh, as they come in. But uh, I, I would like to follow up this uh, you know, very interesting view with uh, a very Ugandan example. 
that uh, most uh, on the um, you know on the call will uh, appreciate and understand. Um, we've had uh, in the recent past, not really recent past, maybe last 15 years, a victimization of the arts, and this is as broad as it gets, whether it's the uh, performing arts, drama, dance, or arts in general, uh, by our policymakers and more especially politicians. Uh, the president, in a recent national address, extolled the greatness of Ugandan scientists, uh, doctors, researchers, and engineers who had contributed greatly to the country's effort to uh, beat COVID-19, but also uh, uh, deal with the issue of the floating island on River Nile. In the same breath, he also admonished uh, the artists who he wondered uh, what else they have to contribute to Uganda and said, uh, what is the usefulness of uh, studying Shakespeare? So these are some of the conceptions that uh, continue in most of the African countries, not just the Ugandan president, but I'm sure you've heard it from many other African presidents who think that perhaps if Africa had more scientists than, uh, than artists, maybe the continent would have progressed much further and much faster. Um, from your approach, I, 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 it's something you disagree with because your conception of total education um, yeah. does not split between the arts and the sciences, but actually emphasizes the role of the arts in the teaching of the sciences. Yes, yeah, and uh, I respectfully differ from the president mm. and the people who belong to that kind of thinking. And uh, uh, the president, not even many years ago, mm. was rapping, mm. <laughs> and his song became uh, very, very popular. Mm. Uh, well, I don't know whether I was wasting his time. Mm. <laughs> uh, when did that, and, I, and I, I'm not here to make political statements, to be very honest with you. Mm. But I just want to say that uh, the arts are so close to us. Mm. And uh, in this COVID, I'll tell you, I'll ask a question to all the listeners. Mm. During this COVID lockdowns, where I am, I'm locked down, and I know a number of mm. very many friends of mine are locked down. Who hasn't listened to a song? Who hasn't read a poem? <laughs> Who has not watched a movie? Mm. Who? Tell me. Mm. Uh, have you read? I, I don't know how many people have read a verdict of judges during this walk, uh, lockdown. Mm. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> mm. I don't know how many people have read the reports of engineers during this lockdown. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so if we want to really walk, mm. you know, if we want to take that route, we can get there mm. as artists and we can really, really, you know, I think we don't even need to talk much. Mm. But so the arts speak for themselves. Mm. So if you are someone out there who has been listening to the music, who has been watching movies during this lockdown, then that is the power of art. Mm. And then you know how valuable the arts are and how valuable law is. Mm. Because I haven't read really many cases mm. of lawyers or those kind of arguments that they make mm. in the courts of law. Mm. So you the have that, mm. yeah, so you have that a kind of, because it's so close, so people take it for granted. Mm. But maybe one day we need to take it away. Mm. If we have a way, but I don't even know, think we have a way. Mm. So we take it away, mm. and then people will appreciate it more. So mm. the arts are central to how society manages issues. The arts are central to how societies express ideas. So uh, um, the arts are central to how societies innovate. Tell me a wedding without music and dance. Tell me in a bath without music and dance. Tell me in an achievement without music and dance. Tell me. So that is how important the arts are. And so I think what we haven't done is to try and build institutions and structures that can support the arts so that their value 
is evidenced, is quantified. Mm -hmm. So for as long as people don't see that quantification, mm -hmm. they will still think that the arts are not valuable. But the arts are valuable only that we just need to quantify and evidence mm -hmm. proof that the arts are valuable. And it's so, so difficult because the nature of the arts is that they emerge within communities. So it's very, very difficult sometimes to track and add value to what communities do. The people who listen to music in their houses, you cannot add value to that, but they listen to music and they appreciate it. You know, the people who dance inside their houses, etc. You cannot track that and add value to it, but they do it. And so that lack of a system that codifies the value is what makes people think that the arts are not that important. But look at Hollywood. Mm -hmm. It has moved mountains, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at the artists, you know, who are entering the, and I don't want to really put money, mm -hmm. um, you know, ahead of art, but they are entering there, you know, they are donating. Uh, Lady Gaga just had a, a concert mm -hmm. where they raised more than $200 million mm -hmm. that they donated to WHO for this COVID epidemic, and it had all these wonderful, you know, uh, late show mm -hmm. comedians, hosts. It had all, you know, the artists, including our own African banner boy, etc. Tell me any community that has raised two hundred million dollars during this epidemic, uh, COVID epidemic, and donated it to an organization like WHO apart from billionaires, but they don't even make $200, each one of them. Mm. That is the power of the arts. Mm. So we need to recognize eh, mm. that kind of contribution. And I argue government and the private sector mm. to figure out how they can tap into that potential mm. to mobilize resources mm. at empowering communities more. And that is the kind of work that I do. That's the kind of work my colleagues at Macquarie University, my colleagues within the dance, music, mm. theater, comedy industry are doing in the country and across the continent of Africa. It's to just show people that there is a lot that we can do with the arts. But you also need to remember that there is always fear that people have for the arts. The colonialists banned the arts mm. because to move your agenda, you need to figure out how to deal with the arts because they are so powerful. Mm -hmm. Apartheid regime banned the, art, the artists. Mm -hmm. So you also need to look at that angle. Mm, from what perspective is this person mm -hmm. belittling the arts? Mm -hmm. Is it in the interest of the country or is it in their own interest? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? So people need to ask those questions. Celebrity so trade. They, they tortured artists and arts, etc. And so we are not well, that history is known, but the arts are here to stay. And we are here to just contribute to the country and have a value that we can add to the country. That is the kind of gospel that we are sending out there to whoever wants to listen and engage us. Now, Bingo, there's a question coming in from uh, Lillian Babazi. Uh, she's interested in knowing how you have um, integrated that perspective in your dance pedagogical experiences with people who have additional needs such as the physically challenged or those with visual impairments. If so, what insights do you share from that experience? I guess this uh, is within the notion of inclusivity. Yeah, I think um, that's a, a, a very good question. And thank you, Lillian, uh, for sending in that question. Um, it goes back to this idea that, for me, I think when we enter that space of sharing art, we don't judge. Mm. Then two, like we do it up in our communities, mm. everybody comes and they have a contribution to make. It can be a chant. It can be uh, playing an instrument. It can even be just their presence in that space mm -hmm. that allows us to create structure. Mm -hmm. So it can be, you know, uh, that kind of uh, um, contribution. And I think once we realize that participation takes different forms, mm -hmm. 
then you identify how to activate those different forms of participation. And once you activate them and individuals come and do participate and create experiences, then that slowly by slowly creates the, a safe space mm -hmm. for a part, every individual, every person in that space to feel included, to feel valued, and to feel part of the experience. Now, my uh, very last question before uh, we address all the other questions from the participants is on art or the performing arts, dance, drama as a cultural export. Now, uh, we live in very interesting times where countries like China are on the ascendancy and uh, we see that coming not just with military might and economic might as many of us uh, will be familiar with in Africa, but more increasingly um, the number of Chinese cultural products that uh, we are interfacing with. Um, I know many people have watched that popular Chinese movie Wolf Warrior 2. Do you think China can give uh, Africa perhaps um, a good lesson on uh, how far uh, cultural, well, not call it cultural imperialism and give it a negative connotation, but how far cultural exports can go towards uh, improving your diplomacy and, uh, and influence in the world? Um, I you think Wolf Warrior 2, right? Yes, I've watched, uh, and I've written an article on China and how it's transforming the um, traditional dance and music industry back in my country. Mm. You know, uh, that article is, was published in the Daily Monitor. Mm. Um, I think, given the fact that we almost come from the same background like China, mm. uh, developed, mm. almost China, you can say, was never colonized, but it was occupied and humiliated. Yeah, so you, from that kind of perspective, I really get a sense. And now it has, it, it has been able to transform society and create a middle class that is more than 500 million people in less than 40 years. Mm. That is unprecedented in human history. Mm. That's unprecedented. So I think in that sense, given the fact that we have some intersections eh, within our history, historical realities with China. Mm. We have a number of things to learn from them. Mm. And we always have to ask that question, how have they managed? Are there some things that we can learn from them? Mm. Uh, but um, when it comes to how we interact with whoever is stronger than, depending on how you really measure strength, right. with, um, mm. the continent of Africa, I think for me it has always been, we have to just have our interests. What are our interests? Mm. We bring on table our interests, mm. and then you bring your interests. Mm. If we agree that we'll meet some of our interests and we meet some of your interests, it's a win-win. Mm. If we don't agree, let it be a lose-lose. Mm. That's how I've already seen things. I'm now talking, you know, mm. from a pure perspective of <laughs> neoliberalism, mm. you know? Yeah. So I think in that sense, we need to set the agenda. We need to set a vision for ourselves as a country, but also as a continent. Mm. And then we need to see how we can mobilize people locally mm. so that all of them buy into that vision and that kind of dream mm. for the country, but also for a dream that empowers mm. individuals. Mm. And, and once we do what, that, what's the role of uh, uh, scholars like yourself in advancing this vision and dream? You I think for me, a, a role? Mm. yeah, for me, I think the role of a scholar, one, is to be a public intellectual, not only an academic intellectual. Mm. I think uh, within the continent, mm. we are still lagging behind when it comes to public intellectualism. Mm. We hide in universities and we Publish in journals that people can't access in our local countries, mm. and we are feel good about it. Mm. That's not enough. That's not a 21st century thinking. Mm. The first uh, 21st uh, century thinking mm. is for that academic to go out and be a public intellectual, to mobilize the masses. Mm. So I think we need to contribute towards the process of creating the critical mass locally mm. 
and we we want we 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 have to be part of that process mm. or even lead in some cases mm. and oh. so i think for me as a scholar i see myself taking that role of mobilizing a critical mass and also using that critical mass to push the agenda for dance the agenda for the arts and the agenda for our interests as a country and as a continent all right now two quick questions that you can conclude with uh, one from uh, lisa wilson who struggles to hear the voices of african women uh, in these halls of giants and uh, she's asking uh, what do you think is the role of uh, women in this ubuntu experience and in pedagogy and then uh, milton uh, uh, or milka lalam is asking um, how uh, is asking about lifting the notion of public intellectualism. How can this become the reality? Um, I think, like, uh, you, may, you may like him or not, but Mao Zedong said, women hold half the universe. Mm. Uh, I, um, so I think from my perspective, mm. as a scholar and an academic, I think we need to empower women more. And, uh, and build on their resilience mm. and their creativity mm. and above all their attention to details. Mm. Because uh, uh, an African woman has attention to details, they're organized, they're innovative, mm. and they care for humanity. Mm. I think we need to figure out how to empower women more so that they take leadership, not only come and be part of, participate, mm. but they take leadership uh, mm. in some of the processes aimed mm. at improving mm. our communities, be it the arts and be it, you know, in other aspects of life. Mm. So I think Lisa is right on the money. Women need to be central mm. to the idea of any African transformation. Mm. Both are up at a um, um, grassroots level and at a micro level, mm -hmm. policy, etc. Mm -hmm. So, in my work, to be very honest with you, um, um, I didn't want to say this, but I've supported quite a number of female aspiring scholars to get scholarships and study in dance, and uh, and I see a movement towards that direction, and there is interest. There is energy in the females. There is a lot of innovation, you know, with, in females. They are taking positions of leadership. And I think we need to do that. And also, men need also to recognize that the world has changed. And so instead of feeling threatened, if you have women taking leadership, how about we figure out how we can collaborate with them and make that leadership successful? I think that is a, a very right a, 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 a step in the right direction they say um in as far as public intellectualism is concerned and how to expand that as nilika asked i think individuals need, need to take initiative so you just need to recognize that being in that small bubble is not enough you either look for excellence as an individual or relevance to wider community. Mm. As Mabingo, I've chosen relevance. I may not succeed, I've already excelled, I think, mm. but now I'm asking myself, how am I relevant mm. to wider community? And once you get that sense of relevance and that sense of destiny soaked in relevance, then you'll see that there is more to our identity than just being inside the universe and publishing in those small, in that uh, uh, kind of uh, ring-fenced journals. So you move out mm. and become a public in intellectual, become a trailblazer. Mm. You want to inspire, you want to mentor, and then you want to initiate projects eh, mm. that will outlive you mm. as an individual, even if you died the following week. Now, in the spirit of go going outside the, the ring fence, uh, when is your upcoming book uh, being published? And um, 
what efforts are you are you putting in place to, to see that, that this is not just a conversation between you and uh, your fellow academics? Ah, uh, my book will be published on the fourteenth of August. Okay, so I has, uh, taken notes of that. Fourteenth mm, of August this year. <laughs> yeah, so I'm 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 really stomping. Mm. I'm really really I'm starting. This is my first book tour. You can call it virtual. Mm. And I'm going to be out there parroting mm. and uh, publicizing about, the, um, about this work. But also, to just tell you that my book came from a research that I did with eight wonderful indigenous dance practitioners mm. in Uganda. Wow. Mm. And I let their voices speak for themselves in this book. Mm. And so it's not about, it's not a Mabingo book. That's not how I see it. Mm. I see it as this kind of collaborative uh, effort. knowledge yeah, and collaborative effort that has emerged from the wonderful work that these eight, one, you know, I, I recognize them. Um, Ronald Chmirige mm. works with um, uh, 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 communities of disadvantaged children in Uganda. Um, Maria Mujeni, Africa Dance Troop, Watimon Matthew, Watimon, you know, group, Senkubuge, Matthias, mm. from all the way from Chotera in Lakai, Olivia Namialo has worked with various communities in Uganda. You have Brian Magoba, wonderful, has worked with diverse communities, Habati Mukungu, mm. wonderful diverse communities, and Colin Lubega, mm. wonderful dancer, teacher, thinker, and has worked with various communities in Uganda and abroad. So these are the people mm. that um, gave me the courage mm. and the confidence mm. to see that our knowledge is valuable. Mm. And I'm standing on the shoulders of these eight giants mm. to tell the world that here we are. Mm. This is what we bring to you. And mm. this is what, how you, we want you to see us. Mm. Interesting. Uh, lastly, there's a, there's a question from, uh, I believe, uh, Sylvia Nanyonga. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mabingo, for your very informative presentation. Can you share with us how you have negotiated the notions of authenticity in exporting dance culture from Africa to other cultures um, outside of Africa. And uh, to what extent is dance in this context African? I think that's a very good question, Sylvia. And uh, I know Mabingo will, will want to wrap it in, uh, in academic language, but I think there are two very relevant examples that very many people will relate with. The ghetto kids, um, um, in Eddie Kenzo's music videos, and also um, uh, a, a group in Massacre that appeared in uh, in uh, Drake's recent song, Tusi Slide. The, the Massacre Kids, eh? Yes, so uh, there seems to be an incentive uh, uh, in the West or an interest in things that, you know, the ordinary Ugandan would find quite ordinary, but they seem to arouse some very interesting kind of interest um, um, you know, on the global scene. Yeah, I think in terms of authenticity, it is, a, uh, it is an idea that is, is contested. Mm. There's a lot of debate about authenticity. And one of the things that uh, really makes this idea um, contested is that what is authentic? Because mm. all traditions emerge. Mm. at, you know, at an intersection of various traditions. Mm. And as society m progresses, you get, you know, continuities, things that are retained and changes. Mm. So I think for me, uh, it's really tough to be very honest with you. Mm. But I try, especially outside the contexts where these dances and music are performed, I try to emphasize the fact that I'm adapting that material to a new context because you can't recreate it. Mm. And within that, I ask, I tell my students, all my collaborators, um, et cetera, to pick ideas. So if I really share with you this, mm. 
kind of experience? Mm. What ideas do you pick instead of the material? Mm. Because there is a difference between the idea behind the material and the material itself. Mm. The material might land you into appropriation, mm. but if you go for the idea and then you figure out how you can apply it, then there you the phenomenon of that art you know keeps growing mm. in terms of um the um, popularity so, of ugandan dancers in global culture yeah mm. yeah in terms of the popularity of uh whatever uh uh, uh you call ugandan dancers mm. uh, i think there are new trends we need to uh, uh, recognize my work for this particular book focuses on some of those indigenous dance forms, but I recognize that you have urban street dance forms that have emerged, you have Afrobeat, you have spaces that we've never had before, mm. uh, is, uh, especially online platforms eh, that mm. people are using to disseminate that knowledge. So I think as we think about our art, we also need to think about what are the trends outside these arts Mm. that are driving the way we create art, the way we disseminate art, and the way we share art. And I think the value for our arts is high. Um, and we need to just strategically position ourselves mm. so that we develop mechanisms on how we can benefit more as Uganda's communities mm. from the art that we create and the art that we share. Mm. And we also need to accept that this is going to evolve mm. and we will keep innovating and, comes, and come to terms with the fact that mm. that innovation will just continue. Mm. So I think there are a lot of forces here that are kind of intersecting mm. to create something that I think will be wonderful and if we seize the opportunity mm. and grow it and cultivate it we stand higher chances of benefiting as creatives as uh, an economy and as society in U uganda and across the african continent but okay. we need to seize the opportunity mm. now lastly uh, mabingo i'd like to throw a spanner in the works um, in 2002, um, in an opinion, you, you wrote to the Daily Monitor in response, I think, to uh, someone, Dan Sepuya. You said that uh, Uganda's music industry is a mirror of our repulsive politics <laughs> and uh, mm. that you were skeptical whether Uganda's music industry is capable of producing a candidate, a political candidate, who can deliver the country to a place that uh, all Ugandans imagine. Eight years later, do you think uh, you were possibly wrong? How times change. <laughs> How times change. Uh, that was 2012. I really, really have a spiritual attachment to that article mm. because that's the first article that I sent out to the Daily Monitor. Mm. And the editor came back to me and told me, Mavingo, you are a wonderful writer. Mm. Do you think you can write more articles for us? I didn't know that I was a writer. Mm. And then I was like, if I can write for the Daily Monitor and the, the audience appreciates this article, I can be a very good academic writer. Mm. That's what started my journey. Mm. That's what started my journey as an academic mm. writer and a researcher. Mm. I think... Your political lens then were not that sensitive. The uh, political lens were right on the money because <laughs> you, yeah, you look at the time then. Mm. <laughs> Yes. Mm. So I think my political uh, magnifying glasses mm. saw what was happening then, mm. but the events have overtaken mm. uh, um, that kind of uh, position mm. that, had, that I had eight years ago. Mm. I think the ads have, um, have taken center stage. In our politics. I'm, I'm, more, I'm, more, I'm more, more inclined towards the idea of the artists than the arts. Mm. But I think with the artists, you also have the arts, mm. have taken center stage, mm. and it's part of our political life. Mm. And I think mm. this needs to be a wake-up call mm. to the entire nation. Mm. 
and then um, the entire continent on the power and the value of an artist first mm -hmm. and the artists mm -hmm. when it comes to moving perception and public opinion. Mm -hmm. And so we need the parents out there. I know many parents just say, ah, my child needs to go for law. How can they go for theater, etc." Well, the trends are pointing the other way. The trends are pointing the other way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very good uh, kind of uh, reawakening yeah. for us as a society mm -hmm. to appreciate the arts and to appreciate eh, that the arts are relevant beyond just the stage. They mm -hmm. can permeate all facets of life. Mm -hmm. And if we recognize that mm -hmm. as a society, then we can figure out how to develop mechanisms mm -hmm. to support the arts, the artists, and the creatives so that mm. they are not only political, mm. but will extend their services mm. to other sectors such as health, mm. refugee resettlement, mm. community mobilization, urban planning, mm. ideas of tourism, mm. cultural economy, mm. advertisement, the list is endless. Mm. So I, I, I really think we, we just need to see the value and we support mm. whoever wants to go and be part of that value and contribute mm. to that kind of society through the arts, a society that we all imagine, a society that we all understand. Oh. So I hope this will really mm. shift mm. perception mm. on how we value mm. and how we perceive arts and artists. And our children and sisters and brothers and husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends mm. and all, all those different categories of people who identify as creatives and artists. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mabingo of Daniels, and uh, we, we look forward to your upcoming book, Ubuntu as uh, Dance Pedagogy in Uganda. I think it's an honor for the Leo Africa Institute and the Leo Africa Review to have been the first to interview you on this virtual book tour. Hopefully we can interview you uh, much later in the year when the, the book is finally out. But I'd like to thank you for your time and for your insights. I'd like to thank our wonderful participants, uh, Lillian, Viola, Lisa, Sylvia, and everyone, you've made this conversation very enlightening. So the Le Africa Institute will uh, record this interview and it will be available for you to uh, listen to in audio and hopefully uh, also available uh, in other formats, um, on video and uh, maybe a transcript. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series, so we'll interview a little bit more of uh, the trailblazers in the art space in Uganda and the East African region. And hopefully, we'll look back at uh, moments like these, the way Mabingo has reflected on that 2012 article and say, look, we were right. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Quez Tabaro, for hosting me. And thank you, Leo Africa Institute, for creating this platform. I, I, I encourage people to just check out Leo Africa if you want to be part of it. It's wonderful kind of uh, place mm. to, that inspires mm. innovation, yeah. imagination, mm. you know, that benefits us, uh, uh, um, our country and our society. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Awesome.